everybody. You're all very welcome here in this fantastic spring day yes. to what's promised to be a very special occasion. Um, before we start, can I just ask you to check your phones are turned off? Um, you're very welcome to use Twitter, of course, at the handle at IIEA. If you'd like to do that, we'd be delighted. Um, the presentation is on the record, but the question answers um, Chatham House rules apply. So it's a great pleasure for me and for the Institute to welcome Professor Mary Aiken here to the IIEA. <clears throat> you will know that Professor Aiken is one of the foremost cybersecurity experts in the world, focusing on the impact of technology on human behaviour. And I think that's a change in perspective. Um, she serves as an adjunct professor in UCD. She's a fellow in the Wilson Center in, in the USA. She also is on the uh, now advisor to the European Cyber Crime Center, EC3, and serves on their academic uh, panel. But Professor Aiken is not only an academic who is continuously carrying out work in this area, but she's an activist in terms of policy, <laughs> <laughs> and you will see this when she's speaking, and you'll be familiar with her work here on the digital age of consent. But unusually, should I say for an academic, she's managed to infiltrate television and CSI and has advised them on CSI uh, cyber, which I think is an amazing thing. But I think the latest thing I've heard, her book has been translated, The Cyber Effect, all over the world, but she is sixth on the, on the Amazon sales chart in China. Now, just yeah. think of that. My little, so, <laughs> my, little, my little tech book has crossed the great firewall of China. It's, it's six in its category. Well, in its it, category, it's in, in, but in still, psychology, I, I but think that's quite a, an amazing um, accomplishment. So, Mary, we're really pleased to have you here. It's, um, it's a great honour. And you know Mary's an international speaker, she's just back from London, so we're really pleased to have you here today and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I have to go old school and set up a watch here because I'll lose track of time. And I start speaking. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here at the Institute of International <coughs> European Affairs and thank you to everybody for, for coming today. So I, I really want to get to the conversation part where we can chat. So I'm going to just whip through my slides and really put up constructs that I want us collectively to talk about. So I'm not going to uh, explain anything in great depth, but really just sort of set up pointers to, to generate discussion. So living in cyberspace, this is what we're going to be talking about today. Yes, and I'm a professor at the Geary Institute. So I was approached by the European Investment Bank um, a couple of months ago to write a piece. They had this, this series they call their Big Ideas series, and they wanted me to write on life in cyberspace. They'd done a piece on water and on forests, and they asked me to write about on cyberspace, which I thought was interesting. So if anybody is interested in reading the paper, this is the paper I'm going to be talking about today or just doing a PowerPoint presentation on it. Uh, you can go to eib.org and you'll find it under Essays, Life in Cyberspace. So first of all, what is cyberpsychology? It's the study of the impact of technology on human behaviour. And in fact, Ireland is a centre of excellence for cyberpsychology. We have cyberpsychology modules at an undergrad level, master's level, and we have doctoral um, candidates now coming through with PhDs in cyberpsychology. I was one of the first to get my PhD in cyberpsychology. And effectively, I originally studied psychology back in the day in the 80s. And when I came across artificial intelligence in the 90s in the form of chatbots, for me, it was that sort of moment of everything changed. And I looked at chatbots and I thought about e you're all familiar with chatbots, it's a form of AI. And I thought, wow, they could be incredible for kids with maybe learning difficulties. Or I also thought about social isolation. And then I stopped and I thought, or maybe not. Maybe this could be the worst thing that they could do. And immediately I decided that I need to know more about this. So I went to the literature, started looking at it, and it came across cyber psychology. 
And then in the 2000s came across the masters and decided to go back and to requalify, do my masters and do my doctors. My specialist area is forensic cyberpsychology. So forensic cyberpsychology is criminal, deviant, and abnormal human behavior online. And unfortunately, I'm kept very busy. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about today is a paradigm shift. Um, you know, people like me have been talking about cyberspace as a place for, for you know, a decade, 15 years. So when you go online, you are logging in, you are going online, you are getting into a space. And, and you know, I had been discussing, and cyber psychologists discuss this as a, as a sort of um, a, an abstract space. But in 2016, NATO declared that cyberspace was a domain of warfare, an environment, an actual place. And nobody paid attention. And I think it's a very, very important issue that cyberspace now has been officially recognized as a space. And what NATO was acknowledging is that the battles of the future will take place on land, sea, and air, and on computer networks in this space. And the acknowledgement of this environment, this cyber ecosystem, has implications, has social implications in terms of the psychology of this space. It has legal implications in terms of jurisdiction. You know, how do we treat this space, international air, waters, you know, airspace? and business in terms of industry operating in this space, and also political implications. So I like this definition. It actually comes from the uh, US um, Army Cyber Command Joint Protocols. It's a definition of cyberspace, a global domain, information environment, interdependent networks of information. Um, telecommunications, embedded processors and control controllers. But what's very interesting is that the joint protocol actually divides it up into three layers. The physical network, which we're all familiar with you know, in terms of the, the actual infrastructure, if you will. The logical network, which is the communications in cyberspace. And the cyber persona, that's us, that's the humans. So think of these three things interacting with each other in cyberspace. And now if we think about cyber persona in cyberspace, we can actually go back and draw on the literature and the learnings from environmental psychologists such as Prochansky and his work in the 80s, who actually conducted extensive studies regarding the impact of environment on human behavior. Now think of cyberspace as a place, as an environment, and think about the impact on human behavior on the individual in terms of the psychology of the individual and on the group in terms of, from you know, a sociology perspective. And then how do we transpose that knowledge and information in terms of traditional learnings and psychology into this new space, this cyber ecosystem? Just touching on here the construct of state and trait in cyberspace, so we see powerful behavioral be drivers. In other words, human behavior mutates in cyber contexts. We see the power of anonymity, which is a superpower, almost a mythical power of invisibility that comes with, in with great responsibility. We see the online disinhibition effect, the work of Suler, where, where people will do things in cyber contexts that they will not do in the real world. We see cyber immersion, the psychological power of this space. Now, at the moment, we can think about interacting with our devices you know, at a distance, but the next evolution of technologies, HMDUs, head-mounted display units, not only will we, and young people in particular, be psychologically immersed in this space by the time you're putting on your head-mounted display unit, you will also be physically encased in this space. I say to parents, if you think you have a problem with your kids turning up at the dinner table with their mobile phones in their hands, wait till you see a row of them in helmets and try communicating with them. And then we have escalation. I've been involved in a dozen different research areas, everything from the impact of technology on the developing infant, cyber babies, 
through to cyberchondria, which is a form of hypochondria manifestors online, through to organized cybercrime. And the one thing that I've observed, and I say observed because I don't have the studies to prove in terms of causation, is that whenever technology interfaces with a base human disposition, the result tends to be amplified and escalated online. And I called this effect the cyber effect. I believe it's the E equals MC squared of this century. If we can figure out this, neg this escalation, particularly in negative contexts, we can then also figure out how to de-escalate, how to stage intervention to deal with negative behaviors online. And, you know, I do talk about negative... Um, you know, I get criticized for focusing on, 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 on negative aspects of technology. I'm absolutely pro-technology. I'm a cyber psychologist. I spend a disproportionate amount of my time online. But the reason I focus on the problems, the problematic use of technology, is with a view to, to solving these problems, to come up with technology solutions to technology-facilitated problem behavior. There are an army of marketeers, some might be in the room, out there telling us everything is good. I'm over here saying it's not so good. And my intention is that that introduces balance into the debate so we can meet in the center. Uh, online syndication, I'll come back to that because it's on a slide here. So we know cybercrime, the uh, cost of cybercrime is soaring. It's just one stat, 600 billion. Hard to estimate, but it's, it's, it's a, a McAfee stat. We have a basic typology in terms of cybercrime. So we have internet-enabled crimes. So, for example, fraud existed pre-internet, and now we have cyber fraud. So that's one half of the typology. But then you have internet-specific crimes, such as hacking, which could not have existed, uh, which did not exist pre-technology. So the digital world, and these are just extracts from the paper, has transformed almost every aspect of our lives, including risk and crime. And crime is now much more efficient. However, the cost of what goes wrong in cyberspace is not just financial. We are also paying a high price in human terms with the evolution of trolling, of online bullying, the rise in sleep interruption and deprivation, particularly in children and young adults, the surge in anxiety and depression in young people associated with technology use. And again, I say association, not causation, because it, we, we need more research in this area in terms of complex modeling of what's happening. But what we have seen is we've seen a 70% increase in anxiety and depression in young people in the last 25 years. Um, and what we see is the widespread commercialization of human data. And we can, afterwards, when we're chatting, we can talk about GDPR, and I can talk a little bit about my work um, on the digital age of consent and why I was convinced that it had to be 16, and now, thankfully, is 16. And then we see the gamification of electoral process, evidenced by the manipulation of constituents' behaviours online. So you're familiar with this in terms of Brexit, you're familiar with this in terms of the US election. I've published a paper on this, which is, uh, which is published on the Wilson Centre, it's in the resources here in this deck, and it's called Manipulating Fast and Slow, and it looks at Kahneman's theories in this area. When you talk about behavioural manipulation online, it's good to do a deeper dive and understand, well, what actually does that mean? How do you manipulate behaviour online? And with the general election looming in Ireland, we need to be focused on this in terms of this potential vulnerability in terms of how voters may be um, persuaded in a best-case scenario and may be manipulated or coerced in a worst-case scenario in terms of what's happening online. I'm just going to touch on this. This is a Europol map. It's a heat map uh, of, uh, it's a cybercrime heat map. So you can see the darker areas are where uh, uh, cybercriminal infrastructure is more prevalent. And it's just, it's a mapping of, you know, where cybercrime is happening. And when I saw this map at Europol, I actually thought about another map and I thought, goodness, this is interesting. So here's another map. Just bear that image in your mind for a second. Data visualize it. This is the Shodan map. Does everybody know what Shodan is? Shodan is the map that shows all devices connected to the internet at any point in time. So you can see the heat map here, where you would expect. 
Now let's think about going forward in terms of, of looking at um, you know, predicting future threats. Effectively, look at all the dark areas that are not connected in a meaningful way at the moment. And if we think that we are having a problem with cyber crime at the moment, what will it look like going forward when we have this sort of heat map of connectivity worldwide? Now let's jump out of cybersecurity, do my favorite thing, and go into a completely different area. Now let's think about global warming. Can anybody see what might happen here across the equator when you have global warming? When you have a catastrophic event like a famine or a drought and where you have populations in these areas that have no way of actually providing for themselves or their families other than using the connectivity afforded by the internet to engage in criminal activity, not because they want to be criminal, but because they are doing it to survive. And from, a, from a, a societal point of view, we need to think about this in terms of staging interventions, not just with global warming, but interventions in terms of how technology will be deployed in these areas in, in a way that actually is going to make it sustainable for all of us you know, over time in terms of the internet being sustainable over time and not subject to, to, to you know, catastrophic shifts in terms of, of either climate events or, 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 or other uh, drivers. So this is a report uh, for ARM. ARM is a, um, they manufacture chips and, uh, and uh, processors. They make about 70% of, 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 of these four devices worldwide. I'm an academic advisor to ARM, and we're, we're doing a number of projects at the moment. Um, my work on them specifically is in terms of educating children, in terms of best use of technology. And... You know, we, we're looking forward at IoT, a trillion connected vice, devices, so the Internet of Things. So, again, let's think about this another way. So this cyber utopian, this cognitive dissonance, that it's a good idea to connect to trillion things and not to think that something could go wrong. So at the moment, from a cyber security perspective and an Irish perspective, we, we actually um, talk about security threats and attacks and attacks on critical infrastructure. The point at which we have a trillion connected devices, we won't be talking about potential attacks on critical infrastructure. We'll be talking about attacks on all infrastructure. Now come back to the physical network, the logical network and cyber persona from the joint protocols and let's think about Ireland's resilience in this context. The great news is that we're an island with limited points of entry for the internet. So if we did have a massive attack on all infrastructure, we could actually look at a physical solution whereby we might secure our island with these limited points of entry. We're not like Luxembourg where it's, you know, a thousand connecting points. The second thing in terms of the, the logical network, we might start to consider um, alternative communication pathways if the internet goes down for a short period or for an extended period. You know, do we move to satellite? Do we move to radio in terms of being able to communicate? Or do we have an intranet within the country that we can shift off the internet and move on to another communication pathway? And then in terms of cyber persona, we have so many tech companies HQ'd in Ireland we have the capacity to have an incredible active response force. And I would suggest that we start thinking about the creation of a cyber reserve. Can you imagine having that many cyber defenders on call that we could actually draft them in to deal with some catastrophic event? Online syndication. Am I okay on time? Yeah. Am I okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, online syndication. So this is, I describe it as the mathematics of abnormal behavior online. So to date, the incidence of abnormal behavior has been capped or maintained by the laws of, of, of proximity and domain. Okay, what does that mean? I'm a sex offender in the north of the country and you're a sex offender in the south of the country, not you. <laughs> what were the I'm sorry, I'll point somewhere? <laughs> what were the chances of us coming together to normalize and socialize our behavior? 
it was capped by, by distance. We weren't likely to come into contact with each other. And in addition to that, there would be great personal risk involved in us expressing a particular preference until we go online. Now, under the cover of anonymity and fueled by online disinhibition, we can syndicate to find each other. My prediction is, and I hope I'm wrong, but probably not, is that this will actually drive the incidence of criminal, deviant, and abnormal behavior in general population. You know, there's an argument in terms of causation correlation. Does the connectivity afforded by the internet cause bad behavior? Possibly not. I sometimes think, if we think about it, this connectivity at this psychological level, let's think about it another way. Maybe it just shines a very bright light into the darkest reaches of human psyche, what Jung called the million-year-old man, and maybe we're all just Game of Thrones underneath it all. I hope not, but it's a possibility to think about it. So anonymity. I think that for us, and as a think tank like this institute, I think we should not be afraid to challenge what I call the sacred cows of the internet. Just because the internet was developed and the premise of anonymity is almost embedded into it, does not mean that it is the way to proceed. Yes, we want a dissident in an oppressed regime to be able to wake up and tweet or blog, but at what cost? And if the cost of anonymity online is soaring cybercrime, if it's trolling, if it's the sextortion of children by anonymous uh, uh, predators or those who, are willing, who, who have a commercial interest in the child, then we have to have that conversation about the greater good. And maybe going forward, we, we, we work with anonymous protocols rather than anonymity online. And that's something we can talk about when, 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 I, when I finish up. So this is my book, The Cyber Effect. And when I was working on it, I got a call from an editor in Washington. And she said, um, Bob would love you to come to his house for dinner. He's very excited about this book. He's heard about it. And I said, Bob who? And she said, Bob Woodward. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I went to dinner with Bob. And there were four or five guests in the house. I know, there were four or five guests. And he literally grilled me for three hours. I didn't eat anything. Every time I lifted a fork, I was answering a question. And what a brilliant man. What an incredibly fine mind to jump into a subject that he literally had, you know, that was very specialized and really get to the bottom of, of every point very quickly um, over the period of time. And I was, I was embarrassed the next day. I actually rang his wife and apologized. I said, I'm so sorry. I ruined the dinner. I spent the whole dinner talking about my book. And she said, um, she said to me, Mary, don't worry. Bob's house, Bob's rules. If Bob didn't want to talk about your book, we wouldn't have spoken about it. <laughs> but Bob actually very kindly <coughs> reviewed my book. And he wrote that just as Rachel Carson launched the modern environmental movement with her Silent Spring, which is Rachel Carson's famous book, uh, Mary Aiken delivers deeply disturbing, utterly penetrating, and urgently timely investigation into the perils of the largest unregulated social experiment of our time. And, and while I'm beyond flattered that Bob would even think of my work in, in any way as being um, in the same league as, as Rachel Carson, what he did make me think about was the environmental movement. Now, let's think about cyberspace. Let's think about this environment. Now let's transpose a fundamental um, um, principle within the environmental movement into cyberspace, into this new environment. And one of the fundamental principles is the precautionary principle. So in the environmental movement, the precautionary principle dictates that it's not up to us to prove that the oil company is contaminating the sea. It's not up to us to prove that the water utility company is contaminating the water. It is up to them to prove that they are doing no harm. Come back to cyberspace. When we have spills and pollution in cyberspace, when we have, you know, if you look at social media, when we have live killing, killings live streamed online, when we have children exposed to extreme and violent and adult pornographic content, when we have children accessing self-harm sites in terms of anorexia or cutting sites, 
who is responsible for the pollution of cyberspace and who is responsible when when something happens on a motorway and there's a horrific uh, a, you know accident and images are taken and then 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 disseminate it in this space is it the device manufacturer is it the internet service provider is it the social media platform is it the app developer or are they all collectively responsible for this space and should we in a social context in a political context in a legal context in from an industry perspective should we be applying the precautionary principle to cyberspace should we be forcing all parties who prosper who commercialize who monetize this space to step up and be responsible and be accountable and going forward you know what are the issues that we are going to face we need to look at this this these these problems from an ethical perspective this is a recent development by by some by a research group at MIT they have proudly are 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 um boasting if you will that they have developed the world's first psychopathic ai i mean what could go wrong what happens when this thing jumps out of the lab and gets in the wild what happens when it turns its focus to the to unsupervised children who are actually using who who are who are growing up in cyberspace there is no shallow end of the swimming pool online the internet another sacred cow of the internet it was founded on the premise that all users are equal but this is not the case some are more vulnerable than others and particularly children so what do we need we need research we need more investment in research in this space which is why i'm delighted to be here in a, in an academic forum to talk about it we need to broaden scientific investigation and we need to consider how we handle behavioral problems in this environment that are evolving at the speed of technology and in my paper i argue that i don't believe scientific breakthroughs are achieved by metaphorically sitting on the fence we need cyber leadership and we desperately need academic first responders you know the speed of you know in in terms of research projects by the time you apply for a grant by the time the grant gets awarded by the time you hire the people to 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 um collect the data and analyze the data by the time you do your analytics and you write up your results and then you submit to a peer reviewed publication you're talking about probably a 3 to 5 year timeline it is likely if not probable that the phenomenon under study has already passed by the time we have the the evidence based studies to actually to 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 inform policy and what i am arguing is we don't have to wait yes of course we want an evidence based approach over time but we also need expert opinion and expert uh, intervention and 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 working groups and policy forums to actually act now children are being born they are engaging with technology we are these problems are happening now my my great friend and colleague mcmoran an irish garda who actually will rose to the level of um of a direct director at um interpol he says we are facing a tsunami of problem behavior and criminal behavior coming at us down the line online so instead of thinking about cyberspace and all things that pertain to technology in these silos you know communications separate from children and youth in terms of departments defense over here justice over here health over here finance what i'm arguing for is that what we need is a polyvalent policy approach we need to join the dots and bring these silos together to look at these problems and how do we do that you know in in coming back to 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 cyberspace as a continuum think of cyberspace as a continuum 
On the far left, we have the keyboard warriors. We have, you know, the hands off the, 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 the internet in terms of regulation and government, governance. And that's based on a fundamental, you know, idealism about freedom of the internet. And then over on the right, we have social media, social technology industries who also have, a, you know, an idealism around uh, not wanting to, to see too much regulation in this space because there's a cost associated with it. And you have these two entities who are somehow strategically aligned. And the rest of us, the 99% of us, 99.9% .9 of us and our children, we get to live in the middle with no say in this space. So my plea here today is let's take back cyberspace. Let's look at how we can collectively approach ethics and governance and best practice in this space. And effectively, the best approach is transdisciplinary. Now, anybody in this room who's involved in an academic uh, context will know how difficult it is to bring dis different disciplines together. I was at one such um, uh, brainstorming at the Royal Society, and you know the social scientists couldn't agree with the computer scientists, and you know the mathematicians couldn't agree. It was you know it was an interesting day, <laughs> and so was the report that that, that 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 had to be painfully crafted as a result of the session. But now everything is changing, and for me, the way through is actually look at all these disciplines that we now have. Cyber psychology, cyber ethics, digital humanities, cyber security, health tech, fintech, uh, computer science, robotics, AI. What do we all have in common in a transdisciplinary context? We are all speaking the same language of cyber. And therein lies the hope for, for to, to create a fantastic forum to actually debate and discuss these issues in a transdisciplinary manner. And I would like to use this opportunity, if I may, to call for you know, the consideration of some form of digital futures forum where we could bring this vision together in an Irish context that may help to inform European policy, that may help to inform global policy in this area. And I'm just going to leave you with... with, with something to think about. So for Irish cyber society going forward, we have three aims in an age of technology. One is an aim of achieving and maintaining privacy. The other is an aim of delivering on collective security. And the third is to ensure the vitality of the tech industry. And the most important thing is that none of these aims should have primacy over the other. Privacy cannot trump collective security. And the vitality of the tech industry cannot trump individuals' rights to privacy. And, and the key going forward is really to achieve balance. I get very worried and concerned regarding how we can deliver on collective security where there are now encrypted domains that are effectively beyond the law. And this will be problematic going forward. So just last slide from my paper. What is new is not always good. Technology only brings progress when we are able as a society to mitigate its most harmful effects. Thank you for your time. Thank you.